Hi folks and welcome back to Meaningful Money. Okay, I'm in my office uh, this time, not uh, the most interesting backdrop as, uh, as you can see. But the reason for that is because we're uh, going to be chatting to uh, my good friend, uh, Justin Urquhart-Stewart of Seven Investment Management. Now you'll recognize the name of the company because their logo appears down here, uh, because they very kindly sponsor Meaningful Money. Uh, Justin is uh, perhaps the best known financial commentator in this country, famous for his wit and his wisdom and his simple explanations of anything to do with the markets and the world economy, but also famous for his red braces. Uh, he's been part of this show uh, several times in the past, so it's great that he's back today to talk about what's going on in the world right now. Uh, so, hi Justin, great to have you back with us. Pleasure, Pete. Nice to, nice to see you. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, the world seems to be pretty messed up, uh, again, as usual, no surprise there. And Europe particularly seems to sort of come and go uh, with its uh, troubles. Can you, uh, happy, can you explain, please, just what the underlying problems are uh, that people seem to be worried about at the moment? Partic particularly in Europe, I should say. Okay, yes, I and mean, the issues in Europe, I think, are fascinating because all too often you see the headlines, they're focusing on the symptoms, not the underlying causes. Because the underlying cause we've got here is uh, actually how the funding and structure of the Eurozone works. Rather perversely, you could actually say the Euro, in a funny sort of way, has actually been a success. I know that's not very popular, particularly amongst people who read the Daily Mail. But, for instance, you know, it is the world's second largest reserve currency. 24% of global reserves are in euros, as opposed to sterling, which is only, what, 4%? Uh, also, you only actually look at, if you looked at the eurozone as a sort of super state, and I know it's not a super state, but if you did, actually, its economy is doing rather well, despite Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And also, if you looked at it as a super state, there is no deficit problem. There isn't any debt problem. Because actually, if you put the good, uh, the good uh, figures with the bad, they far outweigh the bad ones. But of course, that doesn't actually do anything to resolve the current problem. The current problem is, of course, is what you've got is two levels of economy, as it were, Northern Euro doing quite well, and the Southern Euro not doing so well. The question is, can they start to introduce now more disciplines? And the clue came up last week when we had the finance uh, uh, the finance minister in both France and Germany saying they're looking to move towards a form of fiscal harmonization, basically having a single tax system, maybe with a single finance, to, uh, finance minister, and guess where he would be based? Probably in Germany, I suspect, um, to try and put in greater disciplines. So that's what they've got to try and resolve over a period of time. Short term, we've had this bailout of Greece, but that doesn't achieve anything at all, really. It's a bit like saying to my daughter, who maxing out on her credit cards, have another credit card. That doesn't work. They've got to go to the strategic changes to make the euro work properly. Whether that means in the end you end up with maybe a two-tier euro, maybe there's a northern euro called a neuro, and the rest is euro light. They're not thinking like that yet. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if you end up with a system where you've got a more harmonized tax system, a bit like America, where you have 50 states, odd states, some very odd states, some of which are in just as bad a position as Greece, but you have a single tax system, but one federal bank. Whereas, of course, in Eurozone mode, you've got 17 finance ministers, 17 egos, 17 tax systems, and one central bank. It can't stay as it is. But hold hard, the Eurozone economy is still doing okay, and therefore is a key part of people's portfolio. So ignore the economic headlines, look at actually understanding what's happening to businesses, particularly those successful Northern European ones, and they'll still be a key part of people's portfolios. So, okay, so all that being said, and should we care? Should we be worried or should we just let it all happen? So if I'm an, a UK investor, you know, do I need to be thinking about anything, uh, particularly as far as the Eurozone situation is concerned? Oh yeah, it is, we are intrinsically linked to it. We're not part of the Eurozone, but we're next to the Eurozone. And so we are attached to it. Um, because if you look at the amount of debt that is related to uh, those Eurozone nations in trouble, bear in mind, bailing out these countries isn't actually bailing out the countries, it's bailing out the banks, those who actually hold the debt. And if you look at the figures, after Germany, the banks with the highest level of Eurozone debt and these weaker areas, of course, is actually the United Kingdom, primarily actually because of Ireland and Rollback of Scotland owns Ulster Bank. 
So it's not in our interest to having a failing or weakening Eurozone. We need a successful Eurozone and one that's operating effectively, even though we're outside it. So yes, we need to be concerned about it because of what's happening with Royal Bank of Scotland and Ulster Bank's exposure and the other banks as well. Yes, we need to be concerned about it because we need the Eurozone to be successful because a lot of our exports need to go there. And of course, actually, even though we're not part of it, we're still part of not the Eurozone, but the European Union, and that's where the majority of our exports are still going. So we need successful neighbours. We don't need unsuccessful ones. OK, so what about America then? Surely, I mean, that's a bigger deal altogether. I mean, I know there's some progress been made over the weekend, probably because it had to be. But can, again, can you just outline what's going on there? And, you know, well, we'll go from there then. Yes, in America, it really is more like a soap opera. It's like something out of a dynasty, isn't it? You get these little petty populist politicians standing up to have their 30 seconds of uh, the day in the sunshine to be able to explain their views as to how they would run the American economy. This, of course, is all complete hogwash. The Americans are not dealing with the major issue they have to look at, which, of course, is their debt and their deficit. We've got the same problem here. Uh, the deficit, of course, you have to look upon as a bit like being an overdraft. They're spending too much. The problem's been there for years, building up for years, but now it's come to a peak because they need to raise the debt ceiling, that's to say to allow them to borrow a bit more, just to keep the game going. Now, what they wanted to be able to do is, of course, actually all try and show off because next year there's an election. Surprise, surprise. So all those members of the House of Representatives, and of course they've only got a two-year lifespan, therefore they have a one-year attention span because after that they're trying to get re-elected. So all these politicians we've never heard of before all now suddenly have a, a, an economic opinion, most of which counts for very little. So what they looks as though they've agreed to do, and we haven't seen the final papers yet, and we haven't had the final vote yet, is that they will keep the system going, raise the, uh, the, the debt ceiling for a while, but after the next election, whoever's in power um, will then have to seriously address this with regard to two main areas. One, with regard to Medicare, Medicaid, all the healthcare services in America, which aren't very good in the first place, but nonetheless cost a lot, and the other one is the pension reform. Does that, any of that sound vaguely familiar when you look at the United Kingdom? Because we've got similar issues to deal with as well, particularly with regard to pensions. So they're going to keep the party going, but it is not dealing with the underlying problem. They're not treating the wound, which is festering and suppurating. They're not even dealing with the bandage around the wound. All they've done is put on another piece of elastoplast. <laughs> so again, does it, it, you know, should I as a UK investor be doing anything or should I be holding my nerve or what? We, this is vital to us, all of us, so in, in fact around the globe, because if the world's largest economy isn't doing very well, that ripples out. Now the primary driver of the world's largest economy are two people, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Schmo, who live in Arkansas, Little Rock, and shop in Walmart. And if they buy less stuff, then the rest of the world feels that immediately. Now the US economy had figures last week showing that they were getting lower and slower. If, therefore, they can't get agreement on this, that will effectively then, therefore, mean that the economy could come under further pressure. And they may well lose their, their credit rating, their AAA rating. And that's just like any of us having a credit card rating. If we don't get such a good rating, we don't uh, get the benefit of, uh, of lower rates. If rates go up in the States, the cost of that money, not just I mean the, the rates from the Fed, but actual costs them to pay for their national debt, that's less money going to the economy, that's less chance of expansion, that means Mr. and Mrs. Joe Schmo are spending less, therefore that affects Britain, that affects China, it ripples out. So we do need to be aware of that. However, balance that against the corporate results we're seeing at the moment in America, which are still pretty strong. But remember, these corporate results are historic. Looking forward, it's a bit hazy to say the least. So it looks like growth, but it's lower, slower growth. So as investors, we still need to have exposure to these, uh, these companies and to the dollar, but we also need to be probably taking probably a slightly more defensive stance. But bear in mind, look what's happened to stock markets despite all this bad economic news. They haven't moved a great deal. So the slightest hint of a little bit of good news, and they may bounce back up again. So you can't time the market, it's time in the market, so we stay in that market for the time being, but remain secretly cautious. Absolutely. One of our mantras here on uh, Meaningful Money, yeah. This hang in there for the long term. It's a way of sort of uh, reducing volatility effectively, isn't it? It's uh, impossible to time the market. I must say, I do wonder why we're still listening to these credit ratings, given they were the ones that put 
AAA marks on the sort of mortgage-backed securities which uh, were at the heart of the credit crisis. Yes, the credit rating agencies aren't properly regulated, so I'm not too sure why we do listen to them. They also get rather fussy, the American authorities, about which credit rating agencies they want to have. For instance, they turned down one or two Chinese ones because they didn't seem to like them other than the fact that they were Chinese. Um, and they have the amazing ability of actually telling you yesterday's news. So the fact that they tell you that actually America's got a debt problem. No, really? I'm not too sure that us have realised that. <laughs> yeah, it all seems a bit pointless to me. Justin, I'm extremely grateful to you. I appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much. It's, it's always great to hear from you. Thanks, Pete. Great pleasure and uh, good luck to everybody.